we want to hear the stories from the courses that you've taught. Whether in a lab, a classroom, kitchen, on Zoom, or in a shop. Drawing on your expertise, we'll ask the probing questions. What goes right and what goes wrong when teaching your favorite lesson? Hello, everybody, and welcome back to My Favorite Lesson a podcast hosted by me, Lauren Spring, a teaching and learning consultant with Conestoga College. I am lucky enough today to be here with Rob Strabey, who is a professor in the School of Business at Conestoga, specifically in the Career Development Professional Program. Hi, Rob. Hello, how are you? I'm doing okay. I'm so happy that you're here today, and I'm really eager to hear about this lesson that you've brought to share with us. But before we get into that, can you please tell us how long you've been at Conestoga? Um, it's been a while. So it's helpful to note I started part-time and I was working directly in the field of career development. So I've been doing career counseling, employment counseling f- since the 1980s. And well, I was doing that in community agencies locally and then doing private training and development and staff from the college saw me doing private training and invited me in to build this program. So I oh. did that part time for many years. And then in oh, then, oh, when was it? 20 years ago now, I was invited to apply to the full time program. So and that's been an it's been an evolution, right? And learning and developing. And it's been a ma- actually an amazing journey. I never thought I would be here today. So, yeah, when this you is started, exciting. Okay. Yeah, well, not, when I say that, it's like I never could have imagined when I started all the iterations of learning Mm -hmm. and development that I have gone through, the college has gone through, the program has gone through. So it's an interesting journey and we're going to look at one kind of piece of that, I guess. Neat. And that's fascinating too, that you were sort of with this program from the very start. It's Mm -hmm. kind of like your child you've seen grow over 20 years, you said. Yeah. It's an adult now, but (laughs) still needs your help, I imagine. Has (laughs) legs. Still evolving. Mm. That's what's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and how have you found it teaching at Conestoga compared to sort of the work you were doing in industry? It's, it's really a natural evolution because I used to deliver a lot of stand-up training and development um, as a part of the work. So uh, education has been in my blood actually since mm-hmm. I was te- a teen. I was like a lifeguard, wa- mm-hmm. you know, water swim instructor, did all that kind of stuff, okay. taught Tai Chi in the past. I've always mm-hmm. kind of had an obsession with teaching, which is kind of neat. You think professionally, my, I have three girls. They don't always appreciate uh, my (laughs) teaching mode. (laughs) So, you know, I, I've been teaching all my life. I currently on Saturdays coach cross country skiing, like little kids, how to ski. Oh, really? Yeah. So, you know, this was just a natural, you know, my subject matter expertise or content focus has been career development. Mm-hmm. And so I've taken all that teaching background and that, and my experience from the field, and then you put that together and here we are. That's fascinating. And we're still learning. Like, it's amazing how, uh, when I look at where I started, where I'm at today, how I'm just in this continuous surge of learning, which to me, that's the part I've appreciated my children were asking me what, how many jobs I'd had in life and what I've done. And, and then I was saying, oh, I've been with the college longer than I thought. And the piece, and I was saying, well, why is that? And it's because I've been able to be continuously challenged to grow my own learning and development. And that's made it interesting and rewarding. And time flies when you're oh, having fun. actually, and, and surprising. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I agree. And I mean, absolutely one of the greatest gifts that come with teaching, right? When you're, when you're open to that, if you're open to that, um, that acceptance of, of kind of evolution and, and continuous growth. Yeah. Well, you don't realize where you're going to start. So as a program, we've been training career and employment counselors Mm -hmm. and um, in the community for colleges and universities around Canada, we, you know, we started off traditional classroom. And then in 1997, we built the first online courses at the college. Mm. And that, you know, who knew when we started that that's where we would be. 
And so we were doing online and then we had classroom and we had online. And then we started doing like hybrid mixes. So it was really interesting to look at, you know, what was then and very basic online. And then you look at today where we have very sophisticated pieces. We have a full online learning center. Mm -hmm. We have all these incredible resources around us. So it's an interesting journey to look at where we were and where we are and how as a faculty member, uh, there's all these rich learning experiences and for the students, rich ways to learn. Like and what, yeah, and it sounds like, yeah, you folks were interested in hybrid and online options pre-pandemic. Oh, yes. <laughs> Actually, yeah, was with, forced to yeah, for a lot of the world, it's funny because it's like we've been doing this for a long time. And the pandemic kind of brought the whole world into that space. Mm -hmm. And now hybrid is the norm. You were ready. Yeah. How forward thinking. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Well, it's just, it's around, right? I mean, I did a course in blended and hybrid learning design from University of Central Florida like 10 years ago, and they mm. were really promoting it. But it was on, that was always on the, an outlier, right? right? Now it's center stage. You know? Yeah. Like what isn't hybrid today? And I would imagine just as the sort of the modalities of learning have shifted over the past couple of decades, the area of focus, sort of this, this career development professional I imagine that that's changed quite a bit too. that yes. landscape, what that yeah. means, what what students who you're preparing for the workforce ought to be prepared for. It's an interesting piece. So when we started, technology wasn't a big part of their requirement in their mm -hmm. workplaces. Now it's a it's a significant part of their roles. So one of the things that happen has happened is that not only are we leveraging technology and how we deliver the program, but they're having to learn and develop and leverage technology and how they deliver their work, mm -hmm. which is a historical transformational shift. So it's an interesting piece where we actually have a whole course that's around nothing but leveraging technology wow. for the work, which is primarily an interpersonal domain. Mm. Yeah. Well, and that's the other really interesting component, right? Like your program is within the School of Business, but, mm -hmm. you know, I've heard you say the word counseling a number mm -hmm. of times and interpersonal. So it seems like a, a bit of a unique program that folks, you know, outside of Conestoga, outside of other business schools might not think of as uh, being a, its own entity within the school. Yeah, it's well, it's helpful if you think about it's the flip side of HR. HR, mm -hmm. if you're working as an HR professional, then your customer is the business right? Yeah. And then career development, your customer is the individual who is changing careers, seeking careers, mm -hmm. changing jobs, whatever that is. So you're working on that side. So they're flip sides of a similar kind of piece from a labor market standpoint. That makes yeah. a lot of sense. And I mean, I suppose that's the counseling part, right? I mm -hmm. mean, obviously, businesses themselves need some direction and guidance, but there's not that same kind of counseling yeah. they're not individuals right it's <laughs> yeah and so some of it's it's helpful to note that when we're, i use the word counseling with the skill sets like interviewing counseling coaching facilitation teaching training that skill set that umbrella of skills is core to the sector but what's really interesting is that those are actually core skills that if you want to survive this world there's mm -hmm. two things you need to know you have to have the digital skills yeah. right but it's those interpersonal skills and one of the things that allows our alumni to be very, very successful in their careers, and I've been tracking them um, for like 20 years now, um, and they've moved, a lot of them move from frontline into supervisory management and leadership roles. So you'll see them in leadership roles at colleges and universities in Ontario because that mm -hmm. interpersonal skill set allows them to understand people and systems and develop people and systems. It's interesting. And do you feel that that's something that Conestoga grads from this program, it's a skill they have that might not be one that others from other programs um, possess? It's common. It's actually a common trait in the sector, but there's a, the piece here that's interesting is that here you're learning it in the context of, of, you're getting those interpersonal skills and you're getting technology skills and you're learning to use the interpersonal skills with the technology. Right, okay. That's a unique piece, right? So it's an interesting one where like right now we're really comfortable sitting in a studio and having a conversation, but then there's this backdrop of technology that's facilitating the recording and dissemination of a conversation. 
Absolutely. Right. So it's really interesting, right? And that we in the career development field, we have to be able to do that. Right. So folks may come in for a workshop in a traditional training room. They may be doing it on a platform like Zoom. Yeah. Right. And our graduates have to be able to do any of that. Right. Yeah. Whatever it is, where, whatever the needs of their clients and their employers, they have to be able to deliver. And yeah, that the interpersonal skills are just as strong no matter what. Yes. How the meeting's taking yes. place. Or, yeah. Yes. That you can transfer that from 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 face-to-face, one-on-one, to group, to a technologically mediated piece is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And I can see, I mean, I can see that being a huge advantage moving forward and Mm -hmm. that interplay between the two. Mm -hmm. So Rob, what is the lesson? I know you, before kind of homing in on the lesson, you wanted to talk a little bit about the overall program and and the course. Just a little bit about like, I guess, because I'm always looking at what do I want folks to be able to do Mm -hmm. when they graduate? And then it's like, well, what do I want them to be able to do at the end of this course? Then it's like my lesson plan is situated within that. Mm -hmm. And so it's helpful to think that about if you imagine our grads would be working one-on-one or with small groups, guiding them through career decision-making, career exploration, employment seeking, work seeking, resumes, interview preparation, creating LinkedIn profiles, um, reaching out to industry insiders to get um, in the moment information around what's going on in a particular profession. So they have to have mastery of that and be able to take that and coach, teach, counsel, train a person Mm. or persons through that process. Yeah. So it's, it's an interesting one because it's the only program, actually, that everything you study is also implicitly connected to how you manage your career. Right. Yeah. Right? There is this kind of meta. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you got it. It's the, the meta narrative on the narrative of what you do as a part of your work. Yeah. So that's a, as an outcome, our grads need to be able to go and do that. Right. Right. So and they need to be able to work with folks from wherever they are and you know, wherever they've come in the world. Mm-hmm. They need to be able to work with them, whoever they are, whatever their background, their gender, their sexual expression, you know, no matter their language of origin, their place of origin, they're here. You need to be able to have that capability of being able to work it really effectively and help them change their life mm. in the way that they are seeking. So it's a really neat thing. So that's an outcome I'm looking at, right? I want a pers- or, or grads to be able to do that. Yeah. And so th- the two-term program post-grad, so a, a course I'm looking at, this one is career counseling techniques. It's level two or second term. I'm teaching it right now. So I have students who started in the fall and they're now, you know, in, in their second term. Um, they have foundation courses. So I use the term scaffolding and Mm -hmm. some faculty like that word. So you think about what's the foundation they got in level one. So foundation like um, would be things like they got all the career theory, right? Mm -hmm. So they have a really solid knowledge of career theory. One key element is that they've learned about career as narrative or Mm -hmm. career stories. So storytelling and its role. So they learn about that in the fall and the theory work. And that's really important as a foundation coming into the, the course in the winter level two and where this lesson will be the other piece they've had is they've had a course on professional ethics interviewing and counseling where they've got all those solid interpersonal skills so open-ended questions closed questions summer paraphrasing summarizing reflecting meaning reflecting affect Mm. right so they come in with all that skill set Right. So when they arrive in this course and when I'm doing this lesson, they've already got that. That's yeah. helpful to note. Right. Because if you, that scaffolding is really important. Absolutely. So in all the years of doing this, one of the things we've done is move courses around, move modules around. Faculty have negotiated like, oh, I need them to have this by this time. And so there's been a lot of Um, moving parts that we've played with over time to get the right sequencing of the learning. So because they also have a field experience 
mm. um, this term. And so they've got to have certain things in place like in order foundation. to, do, yeah. So foundation, foundation, right? Scaffolding. So I, when, when I look at this lesson, it sits on top of those other things. And that's already a lot. I mean, that's everything they've yeah. mentioned, the career's narrative, the ethics, yep. questioning, like that's, yep. that's a solid foundation, I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and it's, it's also interesting because it's also a fascinating part of like, how does a program reflect what's happening in a profession? So when I started in the profession, there was much more emphasis on what we we'll call test and tell them approaches. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if some kind of measured instrument would be um, used and supposedly to predict a person's future. Um, not as important in the sector. I've always myself been into what we, our narrative approaches or storytelling approaches. I've used that forever. Found it to be the most effective model. Now it's become the dominant paradigm of the profession. And so it's the, also a dominant paradigm in the program. So it, it, it's kind of interesting to watch the intersection of where the pro, how the program's evolved and where the profession has evolved. And so narrative fancy term, but, you know, storytelling. Because what's interesting, there's a lot of discussions we have because we have domestic students and we have international students. Mm. Everyone comes in, everyone understands, what do you mean by storytelling? Mm. Right? <laughs> they get that. Yeah. You don't have to explain the power of storytelling. Mm. All cultures that we're aware of have some a- essence universal. of that. Yeah, so it builds on things. Like when you look at it from a multicultural perspective, it's a really powerful Peace. So we're, you know, um, um, we build on all of that. There's a natural knowing yeah. around that. And then it's like they come in and we build up the skills through questioning and paraphrasing, et cetera. And then we come into this course and we're going, okay, I need them to be able to be very intentional about how they use that and what they're using that for. So at the end, when I'm sitting down, like if I was working with you and helping you to go, okay, what's next in the next five, 10 years, Mm -hmm. I would want to, at the end of our work, whether that's one, two or three sessions, at the end of that process, I would want you to know, uh, to have a vision for yourself, some goals that you've set to be, have clarified your values, your beliefs, your interest, your core skill sets, Mm -hmm. and what you might need to develop over time, mm. right? And be aware of oh, what challenges or barriers are, are there and have an action plan for moving through all of that. So that's an outcome that I would want okay. as a process if we were working together. That okay. Yeah. Instead of that, like you were saying, formally, there'd be a prescriptive, okay, yeah. well, your aptitudes align yeah. with secretary or this kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. So in this, it's really facilitating what's coming from you yeah. and helping you to make sense of it and organize it. So then if that's what I want my student, like, what I want, would want to do in our work together. Yeah. I also want my students to be able to do that. I then need to be able to take apart all those components and teach them independently. So the, mm. what I'm doing at this point in the, the area is teaching a, how do you elicit a vision? Right. How do we do the goals and action planning? What is values clarification? How do you assess a person's belief systems? Mm. Well, how do you do an in detailed skills analysis? Right. Yeah. Then then, you know, let's map that out and help them make plans and overcome barriers to reach their goals. That's so interesting. Okay. I want to take this course. All right. It's fun. <laughs> That's the trouble with doing this podcast. All right, I'm like, yeah. sign me up. Yeah, sign me up for everything. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's the fun thing about this sector, too, because it really like you look at teaching and learning at the college and how the teaching and learning part of the college has really grown yeah. and is a leadership piece in its own right. And then you look at this work and you go, oh, this is so exciting because it's ever evolving. Oh, yeah. Right? So, yeah, so this particular area then, I mentioned values and values clarification. So I have a lesson that's specifically about values clarification. Okay. Okay, and how do you elicit that? And I do it in a couple of ways. And that's building on, again, other things they've already done. Yeah. Right? Because, like, in the theory courses, they've studied about theorists and values, and they've studied about okay. narrative, right? So I one of the things I will be doing is even in this lesson, at different points, I'm going to reference what else they've done because one of my goals, is particularly as coordinator, I've taught almost all the courses in the program, and I've worked on the curriculum outlines and I've coached faculty over time around, oh, what are we doing? How are we doing that? I've been through more APRs and NPRs than you want to admit <laughs> <I> to. <bet. laughs> yeah. So it's trying to understanding the thre- how we weave threads between the 
different courses. Yeah. And so I'm saying, okay, you studied this here with this person and now we're going to bring that into here. So, and then I want to have an opening, right? So in, uh, in the class, starting point is after a brief orientation to here's where we're going today, this is what we're going to learn. I actually have this powerful opening that I've been using that really works well. It's called the dinner party. Okay. And I have, every, every, they're working individually and they imagine a dinner party where they get to invite six people living or dead who are really important to them. Mm. They could be heroes, they could be family, whatever it is. I have them, bring, you know, mm. imagine who that is that you're inviting to a special dinner. And then what are the qualities of each person and why do you want to invite them? Mm. So they write that all down. And so for those of you who are listening right now, you pause the podcast and you go do that. That's it. <laughs> okay. Then here's the spoiler alert, right? Uh -huh. So once you've got that list. I'm right? already developing my own okay, in my head as, as I'm list. listening That's to great. you. Yep. Okay, good. <laughs> so you develop the list and then you have a look at that. And those are the values you're see that, that you hold dearest to yourself mm. and, and are looking to evolve into possibly. Right. So we're doing that as an opening just to, because it's really helpful if you present exercises that get people to be their most authentic, truest self in that moment. So we start the class there and then there's a debrief, right? Where we talk, okay, what can the people will share? And so they do that in individual exercise, they share in small groups. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a process debrief. What was the process like? Mm -hmm. Helpful to note just boundaries and confidentiality, the way I'm working in all the classes, because there's a lot of, sensitive personal sharing. So we have agreements that start on the first day of class around, like if I'm working with you and you share something really sensitive about a value or belief or experience you have, yeah. I can talk about a process, but I don't share your content. Mm. That's okay. a really, yeah, that's a So great, it, uh, yeah. those and ethics and boundaries and confidentiality is really important in our field, in our profession, but it's also important in the classroom yeah. and it's a way we can learn it and practice it. And see the challenges probably. And yes, because like, you know, I get like, excited. And I don't want to tell the whole world about this neat thing you shared. But no, exactly. what I can do is I can say, oh, when you were sharing this, I got really excited because I could see the possibilities for you at work mm -hmm. or whatever, or education, right? But I don't say what you said. I say what I give my experience. Yeah. So that's an interesting piece from a lesson plan design is how you're, you're also setting boundaries or a container. Yeah. And I think um, separate from the content that we're chatting about here, I think as a faculty member, we always have to be thinking about what is the, we're can creating a container or a vessel where you need, it needs to be safe. There needs to be, you know, we have to try, you have to trust this processes that I'm laying out. And that if we go through that, you need to know I'm safe. This is a safe place. Mm -hmm. I can trust this process. I can trust the faculty. And and so we're reinforcing that ethics and that boundary in this lesson, but throughout the course and the program. Right. So right. there's that. I mean, so much of what you're saying, the word alignment just keeps coming mm -hmm. into my mind, right? Mm -hmm. With respect to the what you want students to have when they graduate and then how that yeah. looks down into the program in general yeah. and then into each course and, and then at the nitty gritty into each lesson. Yes. Too. So in this lesson, you've got those outcomes that you're trying to, because I have like, there's a national set of competencies and there's a national set of ethical guidelines, mm -hmm. right? So I'm looking at those intentionally and then you're trying to live them out in your class. That's it. Practice it on yeah. a moment to moment micro yes. basis. Yeah. yeah. And this class happens both. There's, um, there is full classroom delivery versions of this and there's also online delivery versions of this, by wow. the way. Just, okay. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, so it works slightly differently, but the outcomes are the same. So we do that and then uh, we go back. They've done some storytelling okay. in the past. And so we reintroduce the storytelling. And what they do is they actually um, get in, they get into pairs and one will play, have a counselor hat on, one will have the client hat on. And one of the things I do a lot of is I actually do real plays as opposed to role plays. Mm -hmm. And I know we've talked a lot about the role of role plays yeah. in this set setting there um, you can do a real play, which is they're telling a story from their life and the person who's got the role of counselor is actually identifying the values that they share from their story. 
Mm-hmm. So we've introduced a little piece on values. They've read about it. They've studied it. Now what they're doing is they're moving into what is really the critical skill building practice, which is I'm going to listen to you and you're going to be sharing a story and it doesn't matter what it is. It could be a hobby. Like you could be telling about, oh, we went um, we went swimming in France and had this delightful time and da, 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 da. And out of that, I'll say, oh, well, you value travel and you value mm. family and you va- value being out in nature, yeah. right? So I, I listen to your story, whatever it is, and then I elicit those pieces, right? And that's fascinating. So, and then the person, me, I'm talking about swimming, that's from my real life. That's what makes it a real play is I'm not pretending yes. to be a character, yes. right? This is, yeah. yeah. You're, the, it, you're the character in your own story, right? Right called this is my life and I mean what you were saying before about the meta what one of the things Mm -hmm. that makes this program so unique is that students are actually you know they're going to be going into the the work world after this right oh yeah so they're almost walking themselves through the process with the help of their cohort yes that they're going to be then experiencing with clients from the other side it's an interesting piece that's really been helpful because the alumni are really excited about each other Mm -hmm. right and they do a lot yeah yeah. and they do a lot to help one another and promote one another and so we've been fortunate something that didn't exist in the beginning but now is core to our alumni is linkedin Mm -hmm. and so they're out there supporting one another and promoting one another there right so it's kind of interesting to see that evolution yeah and i suppose too just like you know therapists i know a lot of credentials in order to become trained as a therapist you have to go through therapy yourself it feels like you know in the classroom setting here in order to be able to extract these things from people's narratives it's helpful to you know be talking about your own stories in the class and And know what it's like actually because some yeah there's vulnerability and not everyone is um not everyone is comfortable at first like oh okay how do i get stories or you know what stories are acceptable and then you know, on the counselor listener side, it's like, oh, how do I identify this? Mm -hmm. Right. So, and and although we've done a lot of things to build them up, one of the things that's interesting is that um, I'm always learning, well, what could we do differently to enhance the outcomes for our students? And I'm right in the middle of this right now. Mm. So, um, just, so you go, okay, it sounds like, oh, it sounds like you have this good thing. And it's like, (laughs) this curriculum works pretty well. But it, there's things that can be done to pull it together. So one of the things is that I'm pulling readings from different places mm. and it's proving to be it's not a unified whole. So I'm writing um, an open text with an open educational resource. Shout out to Kim Carter, mm, who's great. fantastic to work with. So I'm mm. do, working on that. And so I'm creating actually an online interactive virtual book for this. And mm. one of the pieces is that uh, has been identified uh, that I see as a challenge. We have international students coming in. Mm-hmm. And so w- words like value words, value labels, aren't necessarily easy to learn. Mm. So one of the things they're doing is like um, sh- uh, working with her, I created a list of values labels. So I have like 75 values labels that I've done a bunch of research on and those are being used in the book. But she's uh, uh, we've worked w- with her and, the st- and she has students working with her. We have now H5P activities where they're teaching the meanings of the words and the pronunciation of the words. Interesting. And so what we're looking, you know, I'm, I've got the story piece. So I'm telling you, I have this lesson right now, but I'm also looking ahead as I teach the lesson and going, what do I need to do differently? And so I'm also looking at how do I enhance the lesson plan feature based? So next year, the students will go through and there'll be another iteration of this lesson plan. Fascinating. And I suppose, too, you know, looking more internationally in scope, mm-hmm. it must be interesting to see, OK, which sort of values are might we consider universal versus which ones are are coming in as our as we have a more global student body? Are there other values that are coming into play with future you know clients of these student graduates, et cetera? That's an interesting piece. There's actually been global work done on values. So there's a fairly broad set of values that are known. The cultural difference has come on which values do different cultures place more emphasis on Mm. and then so you'll see certain values coming up so when you know when we talk about say family as a value and so in your mind now you think about family and what that means Mm -hmm. then I could interview someone else and they say I value family but if we tease that out 
that might actually look quite different. Yeah. Right? How I define it. Yeah, how exactly. you define yeah. it. Where's the boundaries of family for you? How many people were in that picture versus mm-hmm. how many people are in it for a student from a different culture? Yeah. Right? And so it's, there's that, va- and then how important is that? in terms of, let's say, your own career decision-making. For sure. Right? Like, do I consult with who, which family members do I consult with to make a career decision? Yeah. Versus well, how someone else sees it. And that, by the way, there's lots of discussion and debrief in this lesson. So that's a part of it. Super. Right? So we get into that. Okay, what does this mean? What does it mean for you? How is it different for others? Mm. Right? And so it because the piece that's important that the students need to learn is no values right or wrong in itself. Yeah. Right? And so they're, they're, they're only right in so much as they're authentic to a particular individual. Right? So they part of the interesting thing is that you can't let the values you hold to be true be judging how you hear the values of someone else, right? And you learn in turn, how do you respect and appreciate and support and celebrate someone else's value system? That's so rich. Yeah. Yeah. And And not easy to do, by the way. That's a whole journey in its own right. But that's a part of this, right? So this lesson that, you know, the storytelling process um, and the debriefing that comes from that Right, because it's iterations. Like typically, I'll have them do a group of three, and you have a person tell a story, a person counsel, a person around the story, and an observer. Okay. And then they rotate through the class around that. So there's, and every time that we we've done the triads, done one loop, then it's a debrief. And what you get then is by the end of all that, a really rich dialogue has come forth. And I have things I want to make sure I address. Like, oh, there's these things that I need to make sure, like I want I wanted these to get, I have a list in my head okay. or on paper sometimes, but it's always <laughs> in my head. Um, things I want to get addressed, like understanding and respecting va- differences in values, right? Mm-hmm. Usually that will come up in the discussion. So what I have in my head is like, oh, when the discussion comes up, if particular things get said, I'm going to amplify what that it's student has said. moment. <laughs> yes, yeah. it is. And yeah. so, because it's more powerful Right. If the students are sharing it through the debrief Mm -hmm. and then I amplify that and and we go around the group with that, then if I'm just giving it like a lecture thing, that's summarizing at the end of your key points. Yeah. 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 So it's that's the piece where you're really working. My work in the class is really then again, I'm listening for where are those moments or those pieces or those elements. And I'm drawing that out and then I'm reinforcing the key things I need them to learn Mm -hmm. in this class and for the course. And then I'll tie that back to, like, then out of that, I usually a couple of notes are made because okay. you want to tie the lessons together. Yeah. So, like, next time I get together and we're setting goals, right, let, um, you know, because you've got those, the goals, values, beliefs, interests, skills, all those different things. So I want to go back and say, okay, remember how we were talking about values here? Now we're talking about goals. This could be a couple of weeks out. I'll go back and I'm, I want to tie this together, mm. right? See, these values are influencing these goals. And you also, when you have your goal discussion, need to make sure that they're in alignment with the individual's values that were expressed previously. Right. So you've got the, what I'm a- trying to amplify and and in the lesson, plus how I'm trying to link the, the lessons together. So they're not just these standalone items and neither are the courses. Yeah. And I would imagine that students feel that. Do you, do you get the sense yeah. that they... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm. yeah. It's different. For, there's, it's different. I'm always trying to figure out who's getting it mm. and how are they getting it and who's not getting it and what do I need to do differently to enhance that? And I would say a lot of my journey in teaching and learning has been um, all about that. Because then, like, it's really changed in the beginning. It was really me at the front of a class. I have 30 students and and it um, used to be a classroom, three hours, no tech, Mm, like no tech, right? (laughs) There was that time. I might even write on a flip chart. Yeah. And then now it's like, you know, I could be doing the same thing, mediating it through Zoom, yeah. right? And then they're accessing, you know, Econostoga and all these other resources and, you know, and it's, it's really interesting. So, uh, and then I'm always looking at, okay, these folks are getting it, these people aren't. And I'm knowing that through all the reflection pieces that are done. So, you, like I talked about the debrief in the class, yeah. but they're writing, they write what I call action learning logs, Okay. Action learning logs are essentially a structured reflection. Mm. 
Okay. So they, there's five points in the course where they write an action reflection on an experience they have as a, uh, um, in the course. Mm-hmm. And that's typically with another student. The okay. first one is, is their own self-reflection, but after that, it's always with another student. So they're doing, so like I'll, um, I'll introduce a piece, you know, like we'll, do, and then we'll go through these values pieces. But after that, they write a reflection post and that's goes out into the discussion forum. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it's written. Everyone sees it. I see it. Next class, we debrief that. So I've got the debrief in the class, then I've got the debrief post-class. Yeah. So I always open up the f- following course with the or class with the debrief of what they did online. Mm-hmm. So if it's in a traditional classroom delivery, they're working together, then they post that, then we get back together in the classroom. If it's in um, an online environment, it's a similar process, but it's but it's but we're it's spread out a little bit more through the technology. So it's interesting how there's the outcomes, but I use different, slightly different processes to get there. Well, and also, I mean, from an accessible learning standpoint, too, that's really nice, right? Because I think there's probably a need in the moment to debrief some of it, but then other reflection happens as students walk away and digest the experience a little bit. And so to have those multiple forums of reflection, I think would make a lot of sense. They get a lot of it. It's fun. and And then they get even more engaged in the content. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you had mentioned, yeah, that you're involved in this OER yeah. textbook as well. Did you want to say anything more about that? It's probably the most interesting part of my work right now because mm-hmm. it's where I'm taking everything and trying to pull it all together and organize it. Um, I'm also appreciating all the infrastructural supports that are now available. Like what's available for me to do this now wasn't available 10 years ago. Right. Right? And so it's really profound and I'm very thankful. I actually have a lot of gratitude for like, oh, I've got these supports to do this. It's a lot of work though. I bet. Yes. And then you have to deal with your own demons when you're doing your writing because you're like, oh, who am I to write this? And, Mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't matter how long you've been doing it or how good you are. You're going to have your own self-doubt. So you have to, you're going through that kind of journey of pulling all your your stuff together. And Mm -hmm. it's very rewarding though. Highly recommended, and it's kind of neat because that the OER work is kind of the next uh, iteration in the evolution of the course and the program. So, yeah, it's exciting times. Mm-hmm. And I and I so appreciate how you really sort of brought that into light. The way that a course, I mean, you've been with the college for for two it decades is. now, yeah. and yet this course is still evolving, right? And mm-hmm. and um. I think, you know, based on what I'm hearing from you, it's never going to be set. It's never going to be like, this is the year we got it. Yeah, because our learning and development technology is changing and our workplace environment is changing. And so we'll be able to do more and more, right? Like the newest stuff, you look at what's happening with AI. That's influencing my profession. It's influencing teaching and learning. So I'm expecting that as we learn to leverage that more, that'll be our next iteration, Mm -hmm. Right. Who knows what that'll look like, but it's uh, it, it's a fun ride. Yeah, yeah. no, I, absolutely it is. And, and yeah, if you have that sort of, you know, um, value of growth, I think, and allowing yourself. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think it's quite common. I hear all the time in consultations that people feel like they're imposters. And it's mm-hmm. especially when they're moving into a slightly different domain or teaching a new course or um, and that's also I mean, the moments that those feelings aren't debilitating, it's it's also very, very rich. And yeah. it, it probably means you care and that you're expanding yourself in, in some, you know, important and vulnerable ways. And uh, but it is common, I think. Yeah. Probably most people listening will have felt that and it's especially common in academic settings. So, Rob, before we wrap up today, um, I would love to hear from you if there's any kind of story or fun fact about you that you think your students and colleagues might not know. I have lots of interest in stuff outside of the work. So it's like, oh, which one of them to share? Mm-hmm. About? Oh, you already but, told us you're teaching skiing on the oh, weekends. Oh, yeah, yes. <laughs> I coach skiing on the weekends. And bro, yes, it'd be nice to have more snow. But anyway, mm-hmm. not everyone appreciates snow. I love snow. Yeah, I'm a um, fan of it too. Yeah. And... Uh, there's a, a couple of things I really appreciate um, th- that I've been doing that are fun for me. I've been on and off music, done music through my life, oh. classically trained as a child, struggled with that, struggled with the, the approach that was taken, um, currently studying um, 
improvisation. Mm -hmm. And so um, started off with studying jazz improvisation and blues. And I'm also now really into classical improvisation with piano. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So it's just been really, it's really interesting because I've learned a lot about um, because I'm not that great in music, like I'm not that good at this, right? <laughs> so we'd be clear. <laughs> it, okay. I, I do it for me. Yeah. And it's a real great way for me to just process my stuff and get away from all everything going on in life. But it's also really interesting to be, what is it like to be a, in beginner's mind mm -hmm. and you're on this learning curve and you're really wanting to learn and you have this passion to learn, but you need help. Yeah. Right. So between books and videos and, and actual live teachers, it's been really interesting because I've learned a lot, a lot about teaching and learning mm. through that. And it's been really helpful. And at the same time, it's been lovely to be able to create my own pieces on the piano in the moment. And it's just a lovely outlet that I appreciate and have a great gratitude for. That's fascinating. I mean, when I think about musical improv, I often you know, see a saxophone player and a oh, keyboardist right. yes. like improvising together, but yours is more kind of solo improv. Yeah, so I do a lot know. of solo piano improv that's kind of in its classical jazz um, blend. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so it's lots of fun, but most of all, it's a, you need to have things where you can go and immerse yourself mm. in something yeah. and the rest of all the worries and challenges of the world uh, <laughs> melt away, right? Yeah, so you're just there. What's interesting is that you're there in that moment and the the beauty of that is that the mu the music and the piano is very forgiving, but you become really aware if you start thinking outside of that, right? Right, because then it doesn't work. So then you come back uh, in, and yeah, it's it's a beautiful journey. And I, I mean, I'm a big proponent and fan of improv in general, and it's right. true that yeah, when you're you're in the zone and things are cooking, yeah. Um, it feels unlike anything else, right? Yeah. And yeah, the moment that rational, judgmental mind comes in. It gets in the way, right? So it helps, it, yeah, learning how to let that go and just allow your own creativity flow, that's helpful. Mm -hmm. The other piece that's been really helpful when you're feeling like if I'm blocked from a curriculum design standpoint, there's two things that work really well. One is going for a walk in nature and the other is just sitting down and, play, and, and improvising, improvising something, even for five minutes uh -huh. and you go back to the work. It's a whole new piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. Well, thank you, Rob. Um, you've shared so much with us. I mean, I've got like all of these notes, just um, these beautiful threads of things with respect to narrative and values and I think alignment and intentionality too, that, uh, geez, I just feel like there's amazing things happening in the classrooms at Conestoga mm -hmm. here. And, uh, you know, I, I'm going to still reflect. I think I've got four in my mind who I'd invite to this dinner party. And I, okay, great. I'm going to reflect on that for the rest of the day, too. And just what a beautiful sort of bridge into that lesson, mm -hmm. right? That um, we talk in teaching and learning all the time about content-based bridges and, and how these things ought to align. And you've demonstrated here how that does in yeah. the moment with this lesson, but then much bigger picture, too, mm -hmm. especially with the changing landscape of the student body and the work world and, and everything. So thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for the conversation, Lauren. Mm, my pleasure. Well, we have come to the end of another episode of My Favorite Lesson, a podcast hosted by Teaching and Learning at Conestoga College. You can find all episodes in this series and more by following Teaching and Learning at Conestoga on YouTube. You can also find this podcast on Spotify and other places you get your podcasts. If you subscribe, you'll be notified each time a new episode becomes available. For 24-7 support for all things teaching and learning related, please check out our Faculty Learning Hub at tlconestoga.ca. I'm Dr. Lauren Spring, reminding you, as the great Bell Hooks once said, that the classroom, with all its limitations, remains a location of possibility. Until next time. <laughs>